Astronomers say the interstellar comet they've named 3I Atlas is hurling toward the inner, inner part of the solar system from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. The clearest image of 3I slash ATLAS does not look clear at all. It looks like a soft spindle of light that refuses to harden into a face, a record of motion rather than a portrait. An astronomer followed it across the sky until the stars themselves turned to streaks, yet the visitor held in place like a thread pulled taut. The frame unsettled the people who saw it first, not because it looked wrong, but because it looked relentlessly honest. If truth arrives as a blur, what story is it telling? How to hold a moving stranger still? Photographing an interstellar object is not a matter of pointing and waiting. It begins with ephemerides that change faster than ordinary software expects. The telescope mount must pivot with the object, not with the stars. That simple reversal alters everything that happens after the first click. Stars become trails, and the target becomes the anchor. The astronomer worked through a night that never quite stabilized. Upper air shifted like a slow tide, the mirror breathed with the temperature, and guiding errors nibbled at the edges of the field. Every exposure was both a measurement and a gamble. The solution was patience mixed with arithmetic. The mount was fed a path calculated from a stack of nightly positions, each measured to a fraction of an arc second. The camera took long frames that would have smeared any normal comet into a pale brushstroke, then took them again and again until the signal teased its way above the noise. Each frame was aligned on the predicted motion of three I slash A T L A S, not on the field. That choice turned background constellations into graceful ribbons while the object held its ground. The image that emerged was not a single moment, but an average of many. Time braided into a shape. None of this would have worked without the quiet math that lives between photons and pixels. The sensor does not care what the light means. It records charge and heat and the occasional cosmic particle that crashes through like a false star. The astronomer cared, so the processing pipeline did too. Every frame had its own bias and dark current removed. Hot pixels were flagged, atmospheric wobble was modeled and reduced. Only then could the faint smear accept enough reality to stand. There is a point in any pursuit where technique gives way to temperament. The astronomer reached it near dawn, when the sky began to pale and the object edged toward the horizon. A final series of exposures came in thinner than the rest, the air heavy with moisture, the tracking a little less sure. Those frames still mattered because they repeated the same feature seen at midnight. The elongated light did not rotate into a sphere or split into a tail. It stayed slender and even, as if the thing itself were unwilling to present a familiar face. What arrived on the screen at sunrise was not pretty. It was persuasive. The stars were blurred by design, the interstellar object remained. The clearest image would never look crisp because crispness would be a lie. The truth for once demanded a blur. If we finally learned how to move with the object, what exactly did we catch when the motion stopped pretending to be still? Shape without surface. When observers talk about shape, they usually mean the bright head of a comet and its spreading wake, a teardrop that any schoolchild can sketch. This time, the conversation began with something that refused to advertise edges. The light was stronger along one axis than the other, and that strength held across stacks of frames. The ratio shifted by small amounts as the exposure sequence ran, yet it never collapsed into a round signature. Something elongated was really there. The simplest explanation should always go first. A rotating nucleus can blur itself if the exposure window is long relative to the spin. That effect is familiar in images of fast asteroids and small comets. The mathematics of such blurring is not hard. If the light curve wobbles with a regular period, the time scale of that wobble points to a rotation rate, and the amplitude hints at how stretched the body might be. Here, the wobble existed, but stayed shallow, as though the surface had very low contrast, or the spin axis pointed near our line of sight. Either case would melt sharp features into a soft bar of light. Another explanation comes from fragments that travel close enough together to masquerade as one. If several pieces maintain a tight formation, they can smear into a single signature, especially when the tracking solution assumes a point. 
the astronomer tested that idea by splitting the stack into smaller groups of frames and checking whether the elongation angle drifted. It did not drift in the careless way a loose cluster would. It held with a discipline that argued for a coherent body or for fragments kept in a stable relationship by their own gravity. Instrumental distortion needed attention before any of those ideas earned confidence. Different processing pipelines, run by different hands, return the same axis ratio and the same skew relative to the sumward direction. That repeated geometry is an anchor. It says the telescope was not inventing a shape that the sky did not provide. The direction of the elongation mattered as much as its existence. A typical coma brightens toward the sun and fades behind the nucleus. The spindle in these frames leaned slightly away from that expectation. It did not point at the sun, and it did not point cleanly away. It sat crossways, as if oriented by internal reasons rather than by solar wind. That choice of posture, if a choice is even the right word, set nerves on edge in several offices. A natural body should obey natural gradients. A traveler from elsewhere might carry habits we have not met before. The restraint of the light was also a clue. Active comets write with broad strokes. They produce noise and drama. This visitor whispered, no bright jets, no coarse features, no flaring head that swamped the sensor, just a held shape, slight but consistent, the geometric equivalent of a firm murmur. If the outline holds but the edges refuse to appear, will the spectrum tell us what the shape is made of or why it hides? The spectrum that refused color. Color is often the easiest truth to collect. A healthy comet wears a halo of green produced by short-lived molecules that collapse under sunlight. Dust glows warmer as it scatters light from the star it approaches. Even weak emissions can betray chemistry when the correct filters are in place. The astronomer working on 3IATLAS expected at least a hint of that familiar palette once the stacks were separated by wavelength. What arrived looked like a study in restraint. The visible bands lay almost flat, the differences too small to name with confidence. The near-infrared rose gently, not enough to declare a plume of water vapor or a shout of carbon monoxide, just enough to argue that dark material sat over even darker ice. The ultraviolet did not light up. The green that would have flattered a normal comet stayed quiet. The spectrum in hand spoke like an old traveler who knows how to keep secrets. There are reasons a surface can go silent. Interstellar dust particles bathed in cosmic radiation for long periods grow coatings of complex organics. Those coatings absorb more than they return. In theory, they redden the light, but at the faint levels involved, that slant toward red averages out into gray once the distance and the spread of wavelengths are considered. The result is a tone that looks like absence, but is really accumulation. An object can be very old and very busy and still end up nearly colorless to a distant eye. Chemistry without chatter also points toward a nucleus that is not shedding much gas. The coma is there if we define coma as any haze of ejected material. It is not there in the energetic sense that turns filters into bright markers. That difference possesses meaning. An interstellar object that keeps its volatiles locked beneath a processed rind will brighten more by reflection than by emission until heat finally cracks the seal. In these images, the seal still looks mostly intact. If there is a hint of anything beyond neutrality, it lives near the boundary where the detector begins to tire. A shallow dip suggests carbon dioxide at work under a thin crust. The shape of that dip matches what other cold comets have shown under gentler sunlight. It is not a flag planted on a map, it is a suggestion that feels right when placed beside the rest of the data. The astronomer kept the language conservative. Color is treacherous at the edge of detection. The line between a real slope and a calibration bias can be very fine. Yet the silence felt physical, not procedural. The object had learned how to keep its glow to itself. When color goes quiet and chemistry withholds its signature, can time stacked in photons reveal what the eye cannot? Building an image one photon at a time, an image this faint, is not a picture in the ordinary sense. It is a vote count. Every pixel accumulates single electrons kicked loose by photons that struck the silicon with enough energy to matter. Random charges arrive too, caused by heat and cosmic rays. 
The business of the reduction is to accept the votes that came from the target and discard the ones that did not. The process feels less like art and more like census work. The work begins by comparing every pixel to its own baseline. Detectors have habits. Some columns read a little high, some regions run a little warm. Those patterns are subtracted using frames that were taken with the shutter closed and with the sensor lit evenly. Stars streaking across the field are modeled and removed in the comet tracked stacks, then measured separately in star tracked stacks to check that the subtraction is not erasing the thing that pays the bills. None of this step is glamorous. All of it is necessary. Next comes registration on the object itself. The software aligns on a predicted motion vector calculated from the ephemeris, then searches each frame for the exact center of the faint signal. That center cannot be assumed. It moves by small amounts as the mount corrects and the air bends. The algorithm finds the centroid that minimizes the frame-to-frame -frame variance of the core brightness, then locks the stack to that point. Once the alignment agrees with itself, the frames add up. Noise falls with the square root of exposure time when the noise is random. Signal grows linearly when the signal is real. That simple relationship is the quiet hero of the night. It allows the smear to thicken into a shape while the background flattens into compliance. If the process is honest, what survives the sum is the thing that was always there. Deconvolution is the final conversation between light and intention. The telescope and the atmosphere blur images with a characteristic kernel. Remove a carefully measured version of that kernel and the smear sharpens just enough to speak. Remove too much and the process invents features that never existed. The astronomer stayed shy of aggression. The goal was not to create detail where there was none. The goal was to let the faint geometry declare itself. There is a line in the raw log where the astronomer wrote a single sentence that could have served as the caption for the finished frame. The stars are streaked and the target is still. That sentence carries more satisfaction than any aesthetic compliment could. If the image persists but the models disagree, is the failure in our templates or in the assumption that this is a familiar kind of body? Models that would not settle. Once the image existed, it had to face tools that assumed the sky would behave. Comet software looks for a symmetric coma and a tail that points away from the sun. Asteroid software looks for a point source and a light curve that repeats with an amplitude linked to rotation and elongation. The signature of 3i-ATLAS pushed both families of code toward unease. The coma routine wanted to find a sunward brightening. It found only a gentle gradient that refused to line up with the solar vector. The tail routine wanted to trace a stream of dust. It traced instead a broad haze that remained attached to the body without choosing a direction. The asteroid routine wanted to fit a clean periodicity. It found a slow modulation barely above noise that could belong to a long tumble, a near polon orientation, or a surface with very low contrast. None of those outcomes violated physics. They did violate comfort. When models stall, astronomers check what they can check. Independent observers repeated the observation with different optics and similar tracking strategies. The same skew appeared, the same axis ratio, the same reluctance to declare a tail. A few frames from the southern hemisphere placed the visitor against a different star field and a different air mass. The geometry held again. That consistency was the permission needed to ask harder questions. One question returned to a familiar comparison. The first interstellar visitor taught humility by refusing a coma and creating an acceleration that could be explained only with unusual assumptions. The second taught comfort by behaving like a textbook comet. This third seems to stand in the valley between those extremes, not inert like the first, not exuberant like the second, a hybrid, if the word can be used without forcing classification that may not fit. Another question pointed toward mechanics rather than chemistry. The elongated light leans away from the simple sunward expectation. Perhaps the body vents from a band or a seam that rotates with a period long compared to a night. If so, the average over hours would smear the direction into neutrality while preserving a global elongation. That interpretation would spare us from inventing new physics and it would honor the stubborn restraint of the spectrum. A final question circled the politics of information rather than the content. Several agencies circulate caution when an image raises more heat than clarity. 
Embargoes are ordinary practice when spectrographs need more time or when duplication by other teams is pending. In this case, caution also protected the possibility that a dramatic release would mislead. The first people who saw the frame understood that a blur can attract the kind of attention that does not help the science. The path chosen favoured patience over spectacle. When numbers explain the blur but not the nature, what truths survive once classification gives way to simple motion and path? What a blur can honestly tell? An image that will never sharpen still has work to do. It nails the position of the object with fresh precision. That position reduces the uncertainty in the path and tells planners where to aim spectrographs and radar in the weeks to come. It fixes the apparent brightness at a specific phase angle and distance, which constrains how reflective the surface can be without overpromising color. It validates or corrects the rotation period inferred from light curves that hover near the limits of confidence. It teaches the instrument teams how to tune their pipelines for a target that does not play by local rules. It also carries symbolic weight that data tables cannot. The eye accepts a smear more readily than it accepts a page of numbers, provided the smear is honest about its own limits. Here, the picture teaches a modest lesson. Not every visitor will gift us a showy tail or a glittering head. Some will pass in the manner of a shadow cast by something that does not wish to be named. That behavior fits the universe we live in. We are bathing in light shed by things that no longer exist in the form that produced it. Most of what we believe we have seen, we have only inferred with care. The astronomer understood this without needing to state it. The notes that accompany the frame are brief. They list exposure counts and temperatures and gains. They explain the tracking scheme and the kernel used for deconvolution. They do not lean on adjectives. That restraint is another kind of evidence. It suggests that the person who took the picture trusts the picture to carry the truth it contains. From that truth, a larger shape emerges. The first interstellar object told us that some travelers will arrive brittle and odd, shaped by processes we do not often see. The second said that other travelers will obey, at least at first, the comfortable rules we wrote nearby. This one announces that the catalog of possibilities is broader than we guessed, a spindle that is not a rod, a coma that is not really a coma, a path that gives nothing back to the star it meets, a signature without a face. It would be easy to romanticize this restraint or to inflate it into secrecy that does not exist. The phrase people whispered about not wanting the image to be seen carries more caution than conspiracy. No one gains anything by hiding a smear. People gain something by releasing a smear with enough context that the public understands what it means. The context is this. We are learning to hold motion still long enough to count it. We are learning to accept that the clearest record of an encounter may look like a memory of movement rather than a map of form. What happens next is simple. Larger mirrors will try. Different wavelengths will listen. The path will carry the visitor south and away, then out into a space where our detectors thin to silence. The blur will survive that departure as a document. It will look exactly as humble a decade from now as it does today. Its value will increase, not because it will change, but because the questions we ask of it will sharpen. The calibrated image of 3i slash ATLAS does not strive for beauty. It captures motion, distance, and rotation in a single resolved smear. Stack by stack and photon by photon, the signal holds its place against noise and atmosphere. That persistence turns a faint streak into a complete physical statement. The frame preserves trajectory and speed, hints at shape and surface, and marks the passage of a body formed under another star. It is the honest limit of what our instruments can hold, and it is enough to place this traveler in our maps before it fades back to interstellar dark. If this video brought the data into focus, hit like to support the work and subscribe for the next image release and analysis. Turn on notifications to stay current as new frames, spectra, and tracking solutions arrive. Share this with someone who follows deep sky discoveries so they can see how a single blur can still carry the whole story.